Welcome, everybody. We are excited to have you tonight. So we have a very special webinar brought to you by Apex Biologics. Tonight, we are fortunate to have three esteemed doctors providing valuable information to help our viewers to create a successful practice. Uh, Dr. Bert Mandelbaum, who is a leading orthopedic expert, graduated from Washington University Medical School, completed his residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and now works at Cedar sinai Kerlin job Institute, affiliated with UCLA. Renowned for his research in, and sports medicine contributions, he served as a team physician for UCLA Athletics, LA Galaxy, and has played vital roles in FIFA World Cups and Olympic Games, earning accolades like an honorary doctorate from the State University of New York in 2009. Dr. Jason Dragu, who is a professor and vice chair of academic affairs for the CU Department of Orthopedics and Endowed Chair of Regenerative Medicine. He has developed many procedures designed to augment the healing of, patient's own body, of a patient's own body. He is also the head team physician for the Denver Nuggets, as well as consultant physician for the U.S. Ski Team. Prior to this, he was the head team physician for the Stanford football program for 13 years. And then Dr. Ariana Demers, she is a board certified, fellowship trained orthopedic sports medicine surgeon. She is the past president of Interventional Ortho Orthobiologics Foundation and is a sought after educator and trainer in orthobiologics and ultrasound. She has successfully moved her rural practice away from commercial insurance and focuses now on holistic orthopedics. So again, we wanted to thank everyone for attending tonight's webinar. We will be covering a few of the following topics. The latest research in PRP and how to select patients for best outcomes, how to increase your revenue by adding a new technology like A2M to your practice. We are going to be featuring a live patient PRP and PC procedure and, all, and ways to overcome patient objections from cash pay procedures. So without further ado, I'll pass the time over to you, Dr. Mandelbaum. Well, good. It's a pleasure to be here uh, sharing with the group, including Ariana and Jason. Um, we've always had a, a great opportunity to work together. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen here if I can. Um, And uh, here it comes up. Display settings. Just give me a second here. So we see the slides, everybody. Perfect. Yes, well, tonight, uh, hopefully, that we come away all of us with is a different and more comprehensive insight into how we think about these autologous biologics, and we're going to focus tonight on PRP and A2M and give you a kind of an evolution of thought of what we have learned in recent years. Uh, Jason and I uh, helped found the Biologic Association in 2018 and developed that as an organization that we could see this evolution. We could translate what the science says to the general audience as our public as well as all of us as clinicians, and hopefully come away with optimal ways of using these biologic interventions. So what have we learned over time? Well, we learned that we have a family of biologics, and everything from even corticosteroids down to WNT pathway inhibitors, and everything in between. Now, my focus is on PRP at this point. Now, let's look at PRP, and this is really uh, from... Dr. Mao's lab, and we can see that they're MSCs in the auger. And what are they doing? Here's PRP. They're swimming to the PRP. And then when they get there, what they do is they replicate. They replicate there almost immediately. So when people say, what does PRP do? How does it work? It basically interacts with MSCs. And what it does is it creates this family of interaction over time. And then all of the growth factors, the list you can see here, there are 1,508 growth factors. And what they do is further summon and make these MSCs proliferate, having a positive effect on cartilage, metabolism, regeneration, the synovium, meniscus, and chondrocyte all are affected by this going forward. 
And I think that's really how, how we think about. Now, there's some ABCs that we have to think about when we look at precision medicine. And there are five things we have to come away with. One is we have to understand that there is a Buffy coat preparation versus plasma-based. We must think about, and you'll hear more about this concentration aspects of platelets, of white cells, the activation, and lastly, the dosing. And I think we'll really talk about the ins and outs because we have learned a tremendous amount in recent years about this. Now, one of the cool and fun things that I like about the APEX system is it makes you think about diving into the biology, no pun intended, but when you understand, when you put your needle in there, you're thinking of, wow, here's the platelet poor plasma. What's in that? How about all those proteins? And what's in that Buffy coat? And how about those red cells? And how about if I get a little too far down, a little too far up, how does it interact creating all these different cellular concentrations and the specificity going forward? Well, this flexibility allows us to choose between leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor. And I like that concept because sometimes I'm working on a tendon, sometimes we're working on OA and cartilage. And I think we go back and forth and now my, my nurses, are, are they, they think of it, we're putting it together. We think of it like you're cooking something, a little more oregano, a little more garlic, and think of our approach to the biological situation. And what we do here is we extract the, the PPP, uh, and we then have the PRP, and we can manipulate that PRP depending on what you want and, most importantly, what you need. Now, some great literature recently for us to highlight. And the biggest issue is that from a variety of sources, it seems like more is better. Ten, as they say, the authors Bonsell et al. say, 10 billion platelets is crucial for PRP to have a long and sustained chondroprotective effect. We've been working this, and you see this list of centers. At Cedars, we've been collaborating with Mayo and HSS, Northwell, Stanford, Cleveland Clinic, University of Colorado with Jason. And we've been working on this whole what's in the PRP and how does it affect the patient for a while. We started, it was called the ROC, the Regenerative Orthobiologic Center Project. And now it's the BARB Project, Biologic Association, Registry, and Biorepository. And this is from our first 20 patients data. We're, we had up to, believe it or not, almost 500 patients at the moment, but this is the first 20 patients. And what we find, there's this direct association. As you can see, the more platelets, the more responders. So more platelets, better response going forward. Which interestingly enough, when we look at the, some of the work done in Europe, and you can see here, this group of studies, if you look at PRP at different times of response, one month, three months, six months, 12 months, it turns out the low platelet preparations versus the high, you can see the green, the definitely pos more positive response. Same conclusion in terms of the number of platelets and responders and the more absolute response with respect to non-responders. So you can see the green. And ultimately, numbers matter. So for us as clinicians, and technicians in this matter, as I said, you're looking into it and you're thinking to yourself, how can I get the most amount out of this, recognize conceptually what we need to achieve? And again, these curves really show us the interrelationships between the PRP final volume and the platelet count. And we can see how we can concentrate that depending on what we want over time. Adding more volume increases total platelets, adds more growth factors, and IRAP and coming out of the protein concentration, even though it seems like the enrichment factor and platelet concentration goes down. It's kind of an inverse relationship, but once you understand that, it's kind of cool to understand. Now, the Apex folks have looked at this. They took 70 patients in Utah, and uh, they looked at the platelet enrichment, and they found 8.93% concentration from baseline platelet recovery at 71.15% an average platelet count of 1,213,000 per microliter. So again, I think the interesting thing about this is that we're seeing more is better. And again, we're spending, I'm spending a lot of time talking about this now 
But I think this is really an important for us, uh, aspect for us to think about at this point in time going forward. So I'd like to stop here, Jason and Ariana, and really talk about this and to think about the, over the last six years, how each of our thoughts have evolved in this regard and how, how we can think about this in a variety of clinical situations. Jason? Hey, well, Bert, that was incredible, you know, and and we see how far this has come with regards to, as you were saying, precision medicine. Think back that it used to be you get your kit, you uh, you put it in the centrifuge and you inject your patient. And now we are being much more precise about, well, what are we actually injecting in the patient? We are now realizing that there are lots of things that are important within PRP. And let's just even open our eyes and unfocus a little bit more than that uh, to is PRP fraction of our blood the most valuable thing, you know, that we have. And I think you'll even hear tonight and some bit, some tidbits of some really exciting data uh, that's going to be coming our way of exploring the use of other parts of our blood, including platelet pore plasma and all of the factors that are within that portion of our blood as well. And so um, we're we're now in the era of precision medicine, but what what's best? You know, uh, and as you were saying, Bert, you know, it really is is nine times baseline. Is that best? Is it better to go to thirteen? And I think there's some data to suggest that that you could get too high with regards to the enrichment of platelets, but certainly it's much more than we thought before, right? Where, where, you know, there was some data to suggest that if you just double, right, so that that's the, maybe the, the baseline of creating PRP, you know, that that was good enough. And now I think the, as you said, Bert, the, the pendulum is really swung and, and we're getting more and more data from our centers to suggest that these higher levels of platelets are better. And I'm going to make the argument that the higher levels of growth factors, that some of which we're going to discuss tonight, are also really important. Ariana, uh, do you have similar feelings, uh, you know, from uh, your viewpoint of PRP? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then one thing, you know, that I keep seeing is that we are just being more and more precise. And when we used to talk about leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor, we didn't have that data. And now we're talking about lymphocytes and monocytes and, you know, and, and what are we doing with the neutrophils? So what are we producing? Uh, so that precision is really, really important for us to know exactly what injectate we are putting in our patient every single time. And I think that the work that the BARB is doing with really characterizing exactly what we're putting in our patient is so critical. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Bert and Ariana, you know, my experience with PRP and that that comes from, you know, different kits and, you know, different companies really trying to understand uh, what's out there and what we could create and also just doing it manually, which I think all of us have done in our laboratories as well. Uh, what do you think, you know, about the modern day kits? You know, one thing that, again, what was striking for me was the, the ability to be precise as far as the fractions, right, that you're getting out of the PRP. You know, if you want to include the white blood cell fraction, you know, can you do it with the, with the different uh, kits and the different manufacturers? You know, do you have to do that manually? You know, getting a little bit of red blood cells, you know, has that mattered in your results, even anecdotally, you know, because you guys have been using this for, you know, more than 20 years. You know, it, what's your guys feeling about the kits and usability, uh, because I think that's becoming really important as we get more precise. That's a good point, Jason. You know, one of the great things about the rock and the barb study that we've all learned that all of a sudden we take Hariba, which is a great way of analyzing the number of these cells. And um, for the sake of, of being uh, appropriate, uh, one of the companies we tested we couldn't concentrate the platelets above 1.45. It was the greatest. And we call back to the company as well. The problem was the tubes and the problem was the centrifuge. And we changed everything and changed everything, changed everything. We could never concentrate those platelets greater than 1.49. Uh, 
And when you look at one of the challenges that we have as a field was there was a Bunnell study from JAMA uh, published, and they found the randomized control trial, beautiful study, but they found it was no different than placebo. Well, it, that particular PRP probably never concentrated more than 1.5. So what would you expect of a PRP, especially with what we know now, and we're talking about 8.9 three times baseline as an average. So I think it's the specificity, the precision. That's how we have to think now. And now, Jason, at a point that we, we can think about this because we're basically the chefs of this. Wouldn't you say, Ariana? Absolutely. You know, I, I anytime I'm doing an injection for my patient, I'm actually joking with them. You know, I'm making, oh, I'm going to make you a cocktail for, you know, this piece of, of the injection that we're doing is different than, say, you know, intraarticular is different than intratendinous. And we'll go over that a little bit. Uh, but those injectates are different. And I love these new platforms that are flexible, that you can absolutely um, take pieces and parts of each fraction of blood and tailor them to the site where you're injecting it. Yeah. You know, I'd like to challenge, you know, everyone on the call, right? Because we're all learning together uh, about biologics and how we can best optimize our biologics. I, I'd like to challenge everyone on the call to uh, to test um, different manufacturers, you know, go out there and, and say, hey, I want to have, you know, centrifuge, bring it by and try to be precise, right? And, and even if it takes sending it to a local lab and say, what, what do you actually get? out of these different systems. I, I, I've i been stunned as, as Bert said too, you, you know, that some more modern day systems have been much easier to get what you want, you know? And so um, I think that's great in the direction that we're heading and, uh, and I look forward to the ways that we can be more precise. And, and, and Bert, you, you are, do you have more slides? I have a couple more. Okay. Yeah. Because then, you know, then I want to share a little bit about the, the, the maybe the next stage or the beginning of the next stage of where we're going. And that is, again, precision. What do we actually want? What do we actually want to capture, et cetera? So we have a, a few details on that. So I'm, I'm excited to share that. But take away, Bert, on, on the. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get right back to you. We're, we'll plug right in, Jason, to that. So one of the other variables we, we must consider, and we look at this systematic review meta-analysis that looks at when you activate, when you activate PRP with calcium chloride, you create more functional result just using the activation, platelets resting, as you can see, and platelet activating. You've got to consider that variable. Simple things. Adam Ants has given us the specificity as he published in 2019. 20 minutes of vigorous bicycle riding gives you 20% more platelets, P less than 0 0.001. The specificity of that is really important. We have all of our patients trained on the bike before and after they give the sample as a consequence. And so we look at this, how do we choose the right PRP going forward for the right conditions? What are we thinking about? And again, when you look at all these diagnoses, and I put this together, and we could share this with the group who attends, but we put this together. For example, for muscle strain injury, platelets should be high. WBCs can be moderate or high. We want to activate with calcium chloride and the dosing is one times. And all the way down to cartilage repair and osteoarthritis, where it where it's, can be uh, high or, or moderate, and then low moderate for white cells, calcium chloride activation, and then the dosing is totally different. So what we're learning and we're working our way through based on these data and based on the specificity, we're all trying to get to be precise going forward. So at this point, let's turn it back to Jason and really he'll give you some of the other variables that we can consider at the same time. I'm gonna stop sharing here. All right, well, thanks. 
uh, buddy. Uh, th um, this is all great stuff. And, you know, we're, we're at the beginning, right, which is exciting. All of us are, are here together and trying to figure out uh, what do we do as a group. Uh, and uh, and this is great again to have you with us tonight. We're we're really uh, excited, you know, about sharing things and hearing from you and having the, this be the beginning, by the way, of some more and more in depth conversations uh, of upcoming webinars. And and some of uh, of it's going to be uh, what do we want. Uh, and at the end of the day. And so then this is maybe the beginning of that discussion as we're going forward. And and as, as I think we all know, PRP is all over the place. We, we've been talking about that. It's anything but precise. Uh, and so we're trying to, to really understand a couple of things. Number one, why is it that some people benefit from PRP and we've all had patients together that just haven't? You know, wh why is that the case? And then we started thinking about it as a group and said, well, how are we actually going to find the answer to this? And we started planning clinical trials. And then we said, you know, this just, we just can't do it. I mean, there's no way to make a clinical trial that's large enough to have all these different systems that really gather different components of our, our blood. How are we going to do this together? And we decided that the only way we could do this is this biorepository network that that Burr was talking about. And then this is just showing the agreement of, of a direction forward. And uh, and there's stars, these are the centers that are currently part of this program. Uh, but I think the, one of the things that we wanted to say tonight to all of you who are joining us is that we want more sites, right? We, we want to enlarge us. We want to have more pooled data, right? Because it's gonna make us all uh, more precise in what we do going forward. Uh, with this, as Bert said, we all have the same procedures. We have same processing uh, techniques. We all have hemo analyzers, so we know exactly what we're doing. And we're all uh, storing a portion of our samples of biologics that we can then further analyze going forward. And I'm, I'm going to give you the tip of the iceberg here tonight. Here are the centers uh, going forward. But here's what I really wanted to share with you all is, again, just some exciting first early uh, bits of data. So this is uh, from Scott Rodeo's lab at, at, in HSS. And again, an early study with just some of the early uh, subjects within the BARB. And you see how they have chosen their responders versus not, right? They had to have 20% pain improvement in comparison to controls in the CUS pain score. Uh, and so then they then uh, created a dichotomy of their patients. And here's what they found. You know, they found that the things that mattered were at the top of the list. One was IL-17. And it's interesting, you know, that that's not something that when you look at the science of blood and the science of our musculoskeletal system, IL-17 doesn't necessarily pop up, you know, as a, as a candidate. Um, but I think what I want to try to convince you here is when you look at this type of data in different ways, guess what keeps popping up? IL-17. You know, it's a way, again, you know, and it's fine to have this with, you know, 20 uh, patients per center. But when we have 1,000 per center, then we're going to really have some powerful data. Uh, so remember IL-17, that was really the big take-home point. The TNF-alpha kind of is this uh, receptor modification. And so, again, uh, short-circuiting the inflammatory process is certainly part of the findings that they had. Here's our early uh, results in CU. Really, same thing of the CU score and 10% improvement. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is this chart, uh, because this is our top 10 responders uh, that we found. And I wanted to, to, to say, well, here we go. IL-17 is on the chart, right, and in, in really in the highest level of correlation of patients, same as HSS. So it's just interesting. I don't have any big thing to say about IL-17. It does have lots of of things that it has been linked to with regards to uh, the cell and the and tissues. Epidermal growth factor is one that I think is interesting, and I want you to be thinking about that. It's a very small molecule, uh, so we need really special ways to, to filter that out. 
And the other thing that came at the top of our list, which we we just, I don't know, I'll just say me, I really think this is going to be a big deal uh, as we get further into uh, the understanding of these growth factors. And this is platelet-derived growth factor, and this is the isofraction BB. Now there's there's really good studies that show that this growth factor version BB is the one that helps detach our mesenchymal cells, our uh, parasites that are uh, attached at our perivascular locations, you know, on the arteries. So, so it's a it's intimal play in between the cell fraction and signaling of a re re renewing a renewing cell fraction, you know, of the MSCs and releasing that into the circulation. Uh, so we have our eye on that as is is a top candidate as well. Uh, as we go on Cedar Sinai, you know we have uh, really chosen cedars uh, because of their great science, uh, basic science, and and we wanted to take this exploration one step further, right into mass cytometry and protein isolation. And I just want to show you again the tidbits of this again, very, very. Uh, really cool preliminary data. So they did the same thing, right? I just want to show you the responders and the not responders. And just that's how the science was done. And then these groups were measured. And this was a little bit of what uh, Bert was talking about is one of the first things that we saw is that the leukocyte population of the PRP is not necessarily a bad thing. And we had, and I'm guilty of this, of, of generating terms of, of platelet-rich, uh, um, sorry, leukocyte-rich and leukocyte-poor. And it's a little too simple of a term, right? Because this is clearly showing that the leukocyte count in patients um, were increased with responders. Now, it's true that it wasn't the neutrophils, but look what was, it was the lymphocytes. And although that wasn't statistically significant, you can see that is the change with regards to the leukocyte. So very interesting data that's maybe changing our opinion on really what should be in our PRP. Here's what Bert showed too, and this is just the overall platelet count. And we just showed that the higher platelet counts really did matter and they really were higher. And this is basically across the institution so far with the preliminary data on responders versus not. Is sky's the limit? I don't know, but more versus less is showing signs uh, for response of PRP. Here's the mass uh, spectrometry uh, and show heavy chain, immunoglobulin heavy chains. And go, uh, of course, these are part of the B cell um, antibodies. And again, these are something well, we wouldn't have known, but this really has a big part of innate immunity and, and linking biologics to odd, uh, modulation of the immune system. Uh, so again, have heavy data here, um, but this shows that we really need to dig here. and We really need to understand what we want to collect in our PRP. And the same thing, dendritic cells, and they really showed a really heavy trend uh, to... Uh, favor response versus non-response. Uh, and then these other markers, right, of, of the interaction of PRP about priming monocytes and, and macrophages, right? And you can see that was uh, absolutely, even with low numbers, uh, significant. So again, activation, again, of the monocyte macrophage line is probably going to be a big thing. Uh, as far as modulating response to PRP, innate immunity, apo, uh, uh, lipoprotein, uh, again, very important, and platelets, of course, uh, also being important there. So, you know, early summaries of more platelets, more lymphocytes, IL-17 is starting to stand out, platelet-derived growth factor, isofraction BB, beginning to stand out too. And so then, then it forces us really to kind of unfocus our eyes and 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 PRP is certainly a great thing. And my question to you all is how can we make it even better, right? And this is the exciting part of what we're trying to build and where we're trying to go with creating biologics at Apex. And this is the, I think, the really the next step in biologics where we can refine and we can concentrate 
other parts of the PRP other than just the platelet fraction itself. And this is through special filter systems. And I think this is likely going to be a subject of one of our next webinars where we're going to really go over the new data about how the apex filters, which is the at the bottom there, compares to the others available on the market. So just think you're preparing P, a platelet pore plasma or you're preparing PRP, and then what do you do? And what we can say is that we could take higher volumes uh, uh, of what's available, such as the platelet pore uh, plasma, and we could then concentrate the factors within it and either A, inject that by itself or inject that along with the PRP. And what we're developing, as you see, is these filter systems that are entirely different than the marketplace. And so if you look at the size of the pores here of the apex filters, they're 15 kilodalton. And then that is compared to the standard uh, on the marketplace, which is 65. And then, you know, you might say, okay, well, who cares? Because A2M is 720. I say, well, totally, totally agreed, right? Both are going to probably do uh, similar on concentrating A2M, but we're going to check it, right? But I think the thing that's going to change this, right, is 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 the smaller factors that we may want to concentrate when we're getting the data back. And certainly one of those is platelet-derived growth factor BB. We were just talking about the correlation of that. And you see that has a molecular weight of 25. And so we can then concentrate that with a 15 kilodalton filter versus the 65. You know, and the soluble TNF uh, receptor antagonists, etc. You know, we, we, those are smaller, right? So it's on the borderline. Uh, and then epidermal growth factor, you know, that's that's even less, right? But then the question is, with these smaller pore sizes, can we really concentrate more uh, of these factors that we really want? And and again, I want to just kind of I hope whet everyone's appetite to a future webinar, right? Because what we are going to be disclosing to everyone is the difference of the growth factor concentration by the fluid concentrator, uh, fluid concentrating filters of Apex versus the marketplace. And you see what we're going after, right? We're going after yes, A2M. And uh, and again, epidermal growth factor, we talked about that, platelet-derived growth factor, IO1RA, and its relationship, of course, to interleukin-1-beta, right? And that ratio, of course, that we know is really important. So stay tuned for some really exciting data uh, that's coming uh, in a future webinar here that I hope we all join us and we can have a really good conversation with one another about what it really means and what we really could do with this sort of, of uh, plasma fluid concentration. And just to kind of round it out a little bit is to say that, you know, here's the difference between, you know, the filters and 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 a little bit of the pre-punch line to all this uh, uh, and some early data. We took 12 patients in each group and drew their blood in the same way and analyzed their whole blood in the same way and removed the PRP in the same way and process the platelet pore plasma in the same way. And then the question is, what do you get out of the filters at the end of the day, right? What, what's, what's the product of that? And what we see is that by decreasing the pore size and for some other reasons, the ability to extract water or to concentrate the plasma was much greater with the apex taking out out of 30, an average of 20 to 24, leaving you were somewhere around four mLs of very viscous concentrate. That is in comparison to the others on the market, then you can remove less you know, of the water and you get less concentrate. Um, so you get more concentrate, but it's less concentrated, right? More water, less ability to extract it out. So we, so we won't be talking about the growth factors and their concentration tonight, again, subject of the next webinar, but what we did see is that the, the ability to capture the platelets that are available in any fraction that you are concentrating, let's just say it's platelet pore plasma. Are there platelets in platelet pore plasma? Absolutely. Well, okay, well, how, how well can you collect those remaining platelets even with this filter systems? And you see that we can do kind of double 
Uh, and it again, why? It's because of its fluid concentration, right? Its ability to do that. And we think again, pore size is going to be a really important part uh, of that. Uh, so we're really excited. I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen because that's going to be a, a really big future direction, I think, uh, for products that we have uh, available to us uh, in biologics. And so I wanted to pass it on, I think, to Ariana, right? Are you all plugged in over there? I think we have an exciting next section here where we're going to do some actual biologics on a live patient. Hey, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, yes. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, really interesting data. I'm really looking forward to uh, getting a little bit more into the depths of that uh, research. But man, it is compelling uh, to be able to concentrate what we used to just throw away. We used to use, you know, to maybe dilute our, our platelet uh, rich plasma. We used to use the PPP to just dilute it. But now if we can then save all those growth factors and really beneficial uh, proteins, I think that's better. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of walk you through our, our patient today who's been gracious enough to come on uh, the, the, the big screen. And uh, our, our friend here, he has been an athlete uh, for a number of years and uh, has been at a high level. And he recently has been really struggling with, um, he's really been struggling with working out and lifting weights, especially that overhead press. He's been super frustrated. He just can't get in the gym like he wants. Uh, and he doesn't like that. Uh, just like any of us who are active and working out and you're held back somehow, you don't like that. And you're seeking treatment to figure out what can be done. So we recently, and I'll share this with you, we recently ultrasounded him, did some testing, and we found that he had a partial thickness growth care cuff tear, and I can share that with you today. Um, and you know, when we, the beauty of the ultrasound is that we can identify the pain location in real time, and then I'll show, I'll show you today uh, the rotator cuff that we can actually stress the rotator cuff while visualizing it in a dynamic stress test, which also helps us see this uh, injury that can then be helped with orthobiologics. So I'm gonna go ahead and just show you a quick demo of our ultrasound and looking at our rotator cuff. So I'm just gonna, I have him in the modified crass position just with the hand on the hip um, and we have gone ahead and looked at this. Uh, and if you want to look at the ultrasound, that we're going to go ahead and look at that supraspinatus. This is the uh, anterior band. This is that biceps tendon right here. So we'll just go just posterior to the biceps tendon. That is that anterior aspect of the supraspinatus. And then there are some calcifications and some abnormalities. I'm going to have him just very gently nudge against me. And that looks to be intact and relaxed. But as we come back, we start seeing some abnormalities through that mid body of the supraspinatus. Go ahead and just nudge me gently. And you can see that start to retract and start to be abnormal and split apart. And so that is his abnormality of his rotator cuff. And so this is where we're going to actually treat this. This is that whole footprint of the supraspinatus right here as it starts to go into the intraarticular space. So that's what we'll be treating today with our leukocyte-rich PRP or monocyte and lymphocyte-rich neutrophil-reduced, if we want to be really specific, uh, for his partial thickness rotator cuff tear. So if we want to get to how we actually prepare this, we did previously draw blood and we put it in our centrifuge. And, and I'd like to share with you how exactly we go about creating that leukocyte-rich or lymphocyte monocyte-rich neutrophil-depleted um, product for our injectate for our uh, rotator cuff partial thickness tear. All right, so she's gotten that spin done. She's then gonna go ahead and very gently place this in the um, bench top press. We'll just uh, pop that top off. There we go. It's off and into the bench top press. And 
And the thing that's really great about this is it's super, super precise so that you can absolutely be able to draw off your, uh, if you see that we've added a light so you can actually see that PPP layer, that Buffy coat uh, looks beautiful. And so we're gonna be drawing off. Yes, Dr. Demers, sorry to jump in. As you can see, there are measurement markers on the front of the concentration device. And where you requested a 6 ml harvest of PRP, you will push your Buffy coat layer up to the 6 ml marker on the concentration device while extracting the platelet pore plasma. You will remove the 60 ml syringe and set that aside to process the protein concentrate. Replace it with the prime 12 ml syringe. You will then continue using the benchtop press to push up the Buffy coat into the 12 ml syringe. This is where you have the flexibility to capture the type of PRP your patient needs. You can stop when you get a small puff of red for a leukocyte pore sample, or push in more red blood cells to capture more leukocytes. Here you can see we've captured close to 1 ml of the red blood cells to create a leukocyte-rich, high-dose PRP. Back to you, Dr. Demers. We're going to go ahead and, uh, yep, we're going to go ahead and prep our patient. Uh, We'll put him back in that modified crass position, and we're super excited to go ahead and get this guy injected with our PRP. I previously injected him uh, with a super uh, scapular nerve block, and that's been for me a really big game changer to help do this with really minimal uh, discomfort and pain. So I'm just going to grab this over here, and she's attaching that to the uh, filter. She's getting that set for y'all so that you guys can see how this works. And uh, then we'll kind of, I'll, I'll show you exactly, you won't miss anything. I'll show you exactly how this is going to work, how this is going to go. And as, as Andrea is prepping this filter, you can see she attached a small green filter onto the end, the opposing side. What that will do, a lot, it will allow you to press the platelet pore plasma into the filter. It will release the air out of the opposite side to reduce foaming. And when you do that, the plunger will go until you hit the platelet pore plasma and it will stop proceeding. So now as she preps it here, she's going to attach our Vaculox syringe onto the bottom of the PC filter. And once she engages that, it will create a closed system and allow the platelet pore plasma to be processed through the 15 KDA filter. And you'll actually see the water start to fill the Vaculox syringe. And it's, it's surprising how clear it is and how quickly it can process. You can see that water coming out so, so precise, it's awesome. All right, so here we are. We're ready uh, to inject our platelet-rich plasma, and we have a 25 gauge needle, and we've got this uh, rotator cuff area, right? That's supraspinatus, and I'm going to show you that kind of crummy looking supraspinatus, uh, if you can. And then what we'll do is we're just going to inject in one, two, three, four. And what you can see is the needle coming in. Right into the tendon. And you can see that tear. Now, if it was a normal tendon, it wouldn't accept the fluid. But that full tear, that interstitial tear, is accepting fluid like crazy. And so I think this is the benefit. And I'm just going to change that a little bit, that trajectory a little bit, and get this other area. And that's the benefit of ultrasound guided injection, is I can precisely place this injectate in the supraspinatus. And this is all not normal tendon. This is all abnormal tendon, which is why we're here. And so then I'm going to just change my uh, area where we're going to go. And this is all beautiful. Okay. 
And then another injection right through here. And a little bit more gel. You can see right through here. And that's a little bit in the posterior aspect. Here we are. That's that posterior supraspinatus. And this is just amazing. This is working out so well for him. I'm so pleased. And so we now know we have that high platelet concentration with some leukocyte and lymphocyte. I'm going to save a little bit because we also know that he has um, a craniocorbicular joint uh, that is problematic. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and put the rest once our um, plasma concentrate is ready. We'll put the rest in his glenohumeral joint as well. So here we see his craniocorbicular joint, which is definitely arthritic. He has pain at night. And uh, we know that that has been bothering him. He can't sleep on it. And so I go from back to front. And we'll go out of plane. One, two, three, four. You can see that bright white dot right there. Get that centered, my, my center line. Sneak right in there. All right. You can see our beautiful PRP. Okay, about one cc right through there. And then we'll do the rest in the glenohumeral joint. So you have our PC, platelet concentrate. And this is where I'm going to be making my cocktail for him. <laughs> So this is uh, a more viscous fluid. You can come, got that over there. Makes sense. Great, uh, yeah, I'll just take that. So this is the remainder of my PRP right here. I'll take that little guy. There we go. Perfect. Um, and then, we can just do that. It's a, a lure to lure. And it'll get, Just a little bit more viscous, which is uh, the A2M is quite a little, uh, excuse me, the plasma concentrate with the A2M in it is uh, just a little bit more viscous than you'd usually think. So I like to mix it with either um, some reserve PPP or PRP, um, whatever makes sense. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and put this in the joint. Sometimes you need a 21. Uh, uh, for the viscosity of that uh, plasma concentrate, but um, I'm going to just go with a, a 22 and we'll see. Uh, in theory, he is blocked, so it shouldn't be <laughs> too sore. I also did put some lidocaine in the uh, posterior portal, so we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, really critical step when you're using ultrasound is just make sure you get all the air out of the needle prior to injection. Otherwise, you may be sad that you can't see anything. So here we are. Let's see. Just a little bit more depth. And this is our glenohumeral joint. And we're going to go ahead and just pop this in there. One, two, three, four. All right. And you can see he's about three centimeters. So I did choose a uh, longer needle and that trajectory is pretty steep. See that coming through. Can't see, shouldn't go. So 
yeah, look before you leave. You're doing okay. Doing okay? Yeah. <laughs> you don't feel a thing? That's so encouraging. And as you guys can see, this trajectory is, is quite steep. As you're getting into the joint there, uh, there was another question, uh, uh, and that was, uh, do you guys use anesthetics while injecting your PRP, and does the anesthetic get mixed up uh, with the PRP when you're injecting it, Bert? Yeah, generally speaking, I think that uh, we believe that the canes as a group have a toxic effect on platelets and some of the biological function. We don't know all to it, but we know it's it's probably toxic to some degree and don't want to really put uh, canes in the area where we want to put our PRP or our A2M. Uh, so generally we advise against using the canes for doing a local anesthesia along with ethyl chloride but avoiding any type of uh, injections with lidocaine, even rapivacaine to, the, to this extent, uh, into a joint or into the cuff tendon. Yeah, yeah and I I, think, go ahead, Jason. Well, I think that's why you said A, that you give them the block B. I, I definitely use ethyl chloride myself, right, of just some topical for the skin. And, and I think the, the thing we've learned most about injections is that number one, the velocity of the injections is highly correlated with the pain experience, right? So very slow injections is key. And then volume is key as well, right? So uh, there isn't something that you couldn't make more painful because of a high volume that you have. So really watching your volume when you do the injections as well and not using the local anesthetics. Go ahead, Ariane. Yeah, so there's a couple of studies that have been done about the local anesthetics, um, and I, it's really interesting if you do dilute um, ropivacaine or lidocaine, that has been uh, in better tolerated from a cellular perspective. Uh, so like 0.125% lidocaine or 0.125% ropivacaine diluted in your injectate um, has been shown to be uh, not uh, harmful to the cells. There's a couple of studies out there. So I, I would like to, you know, if my patients are really struggling, um, I try not to put any uh, local anesthetic in the joint for sure. Um, but in the intratendinous, I think um, that dilute um, lidocaine or ropivacaine uh, has been shown in a number of studies to be uh, safe from a cellular level. Yeah. Hey, you know, getting back to the PRP you made, and I want to get Bert's opinion on this too. You know, it's a little bit of a unique system, uh, Apex with the press. Uh, you have that cone at top where you can really get a little heads up that the you're getting into the buffy coat layer and then into the red blood cell layer right below it. Um, you know, many have said, and maybe I've been one, that, you know, red blood cells are not necessarily the things that we want in our PRP. Uh, but I but I wanted to share first something that when we did when we use the Apex system and we didn't, you know, we, we deliberately stopped short of the of the any red blood cells and and we got part you know, of the of that buffy coat layer, our number of platelets were much less. And so the you this is a very, I think, unique system and how uh, the, with the platelets are at the bottom, really, of that, the majority of them at the bo bottom of the buffy coat. And I think it's the reason, again, where you just have that little flash of red and, and it has been true that I've uh, injected in my patients and I have not seen the reactions as the, let's just say other heavy leukocyte rich where you have more of a blood fraction, that's painful, uh, it has not been. But I just wanted to say that because again, I've tried also not the flesh of red and you have to be really careful and maybe even using a little bit of tubing that you can really see, you know, more of the precision, right, of, of pulling up on your syringe, seeing exactly when that buffy coat comes through, 
your line and into your syringe. And when that red blood cell fraction, you can see the line and you can stop, you know, but you need to make sure that you extract that, that Buffy coat part. You know, Bert, has that been your experience with this machine or, or, or what's your thoughts on the red blood cells within uh, the PRP? I think, you know, I don't mind a little pink, uh, which I think in, includes the the layer and the cells that you're talking about, Jason. I, I agree. I think you've got to get right to that bottom, but you've just got to avoid being red. You've just got to get a little bit. It, it It's kind of like a... Um, you know, when you're mixing your, your drink, it's more like a rosé uh, than it is a pure um, apple juice. Uh, it's just got a little pink in there. And I think then you get those highly concentrated, highly concentrated platelets that we're after. You're clearly from California with a wine reference. I know, of course. <laughs> Ariana, what's your thoughts on the, on the composition and you know, using that cone and being really precise uh, with Apex system? Yeah, I, I love it. And, uh, you know, you absolutely are right. When you dig in to that, um, into where the red cells are, uh, you do get a higher um, platelet count. And for sure, uh, it, it's I've seen it time and time again. Um, that being said, when you look at it, you're like, gosh, it's so red. But if you send it through your hemocytometer, that red cell count is very low, very low. Um, and so I feel confident when I'm injecting my patients and we just get that little puff or little flash of red that number one, my platelet count is high and my red blood cell count is low. Uh, and, and, and we see it every, every patient that I've been using the apex uh, system with that red blood cell count is, is really low, like less than 1%. Yeah. Um, as we're, uh, getting, you know, running out of time for the, the webinar, just a couple of really quick questions uh, for you guys, kind of a yes, no, and a real quick answer. Uh, how does the panel feel about using allogenic umbilical cord derived stem cells? for treatment of tendons and joints? Well, at this point, <laughs> uh, we know by the recommendations of our FDA, which we have to live in, in, in this world, that at the moment, we're not covered to use that. Um, and in addition, you know, part of what um, Ariana, Jason, and myself are focusing on is doing things that are evidence-based. We're trying to advance science. We're trying to learn more. And I don't think the that we've really been able to show efficacy in this regard. So two reasons. Unless we have some type of trial, we can't use this. Number two, we don't have the evidence. So I think we're limited in our ability to, to recommend that. And I, I think at this moment in time, you leave yourself really uh, uncovered in terms of uh, and liable to if anything goes wrong. Yeah, anything to add to that, Ariana? Yeah, I would say at, at this point, the FDA has made it pretty clear that that's not um, appropriate for use at this point. Uh, and I talked to lots of doctors that said, well, but it's so good. And that may be, it's just the FDA has has weighed in at this point. And I'm not, I don't feel confident and comfortable to go against the FDA at this point. Yeah. And I would just quickly throw in that, you know, we all have biologic centers uh, on the panel and uh, I'll just speak for myself, have had a pretty significant amount of patients come in with complications of the allogenic umbilical cord cells. And, and it is a, a, a kind of a reaction of a pseudosepsis, a fibrotic reaction, and with arthroscopy, uh, they're definitely, it's it's kind of an arthrofibrotic kind of disorganized collagen. It's it's a, a very interesting to look at it. Maybe one day on a webinar, we'll talk about it. Um, but I think there, you know, the from the biologic perspective, we we all hear that the stem cells are immune privileged and and the reality is in these preparations that there are proteins that are not immune privilege and there's some level of an immune reaction and it is what the FDA is worried about uh, with these and of course their purity, et cetera. So I think all of us have been uh, saying, you know, uh, well served to stay away from uh, that at this point. 
Uh, the impact of leukocyte richness or lack thereof varies based on site injected, yes or no. Bert. You know, I think the group at the Rizzoli Institute did a study showing no differences between rich and deficient. Um, I, I think that as, I think we're going to move away from this concept that one is any better than the next. And, and some of our colleagues have pointed out that this is a dynamic series of changes that we're influencing. What happens at one time may be M1 microphages, but the next phase may be M2 that are anti-inflammatory. So, so I do think that we're learning this is probably going to be less of, as a variable. I can't wait until we have our BARB data when we really put this issue to rest. Yeah. yeah. And I think the other thing across the board historically is we thought we were comparing apples to apples, but as it's been very clear that when you dig in and, and get that uh, lower buffy coat with the leukocytes, you also get more platelets. And so with that was elevated platelet dose. And so we weren't really comparing apples to apples. So as we go forward and we know what the platelet doses are, I think that there's going to be more data to clarify that question better. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always go back to the initial studies, you know, that we did with the uh, the use of the neutrophils and the PRP and within the animal models inciting an inflammatory reaction, right? It was very clear that it, that it did that. And, and I think that's, it, we're all talking the same thing. Do we need to incite an inflammatory reaction for a disease process like tendinopathy? You know, it's chronic, it's not acute, but maybe yes and maybe no. Maybe it is the application of the right factors that are going to change the cell composition and the, and turn on the necessary, um, you know, the cell machinery to make normal tendon again. Maybe it is turning on inflammation. We don't know. So I think that overall, the answer to the question for all of us is we don't know the answer to it, but we're all looking forward to finding that together, right? With our biorepository systems and having many of uh, you guys join us, right? In, in this quest to really find the answer to that. Uh, what's the cost of the APEX system? We'll leave that uh, uh, business side you know, out. And of course, feel free to get to the website. I, I don't know, uh, but I'm sure that you can find it. You can request uh, about uh, pricing of the APEX system. So we'll skip over that if you don't mind. Do you uh, counsel uh, patients regarding specific improvements in PROMs uh, after uh, uh, PRP procedures? And, and I would just say, you know, we are looking for minimal clinically significant difference. That's what we have done of uh, separating the responders and not. So I think overall we would agree that we do use outcomes measures, right? Because we really want to know more precisely how our patients are doing. The cutoff of what you consider success or not, uh, that is probably a little bit uh, controversial. Uh, what post-procedure precautions and activity uh, restrictions do you give patients? If we can narrow it, please, to PRP, and uh, PRP given intraarticularly and intratendinously, let's just, uh, those two fire off quickly, post-procedure precautions, BERT, for intraarticular and intratendinous injections of PRP? Uh, I personally like the biking. Um, I have patients uh, cycle, uh, whether they do it outdoor or indoor, uh, before and after, and I don't give them limitations. I, I do recommend they don't spend a lot of time running or walking, but cycling non-impact, I think, is really good and seems to be handled very favorably. Yep. Ariana? Right, very limited restrictions. I let them go back to work. Intraarticular, I, I give them very few restrictions. Intratendinous, if it's low-grade partial tears, I give them really no restrictions. High-grade partial tears, I'll give them, you know, some restrictions. Um, and our friend Don Buford gave me a really good kind of uh, rule of thumb is take any orthopedic surgery that we do um, and use that as a correlate for like rotator cuff. And you start at the six week mark, assuming that they're healed, right? And you can use that rehab protocol going forward. I kind of like that. I, I cuz those all we all are very facile in those rehab protocols, so you just start at week 6. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, great. Um, uh, Quick experience, and dirty. <laughs> experience with liquid platelet rich fibrin, you know, a, a variation of PRP, et cetera. So that's uh, a lot of a kind of business acumen, et cetera, different systems, all it's about the precision of what you are putting in, right? So I would just argue liquid platelet rich uh, fibrin is a type of activated PRP. And so then again, we just need to be precise. Yes, we have, as Bert said, uh, experience with that. But again, it's it's something that we're going to find with the repository network is do you need to activate it uh, uh, for the fibrin and, and what should be in your PRP? Uh, Ariana, a question for you. Fluoro, using contrast, will that affect the quality of your PRP? Yeah, so there has been uh, pretty good data that fluoro, um, the, that the uh, the uh, medications that we use to be able to see um, is at full strength detrimental across the board. Um, and then ultimately, um, there has been a, a, just one or two studies showing that using dilute um, medications may be safe, but gosh, I would definitely, looking at the data, I would definitely err on the side of minimizing the amount that you're using. So like an eighth of a cc um, per injectate seems to be reasonably safe. It's better to know where you're going than not know. Uh, so if there's no way that you can know besides using contrast, then use as little as possible. Uh, good, good advice. Uh, there are many business questions, and I think overall uh, that would be a great subject, right, for another webinar to really dig into that. And that's about uh, uh, you talk directly about pricing and about expectations and all that. So let's save all those for another uh, good uh, webinar. What's a reasonable price to ask for this type of injection? That's again, uh, same thing. Uh, um, lots of uh, questions on the filters, it's the subject of another uh, webinar. And so then let's save all the filter related questions, which is, I think, the protein concentrates. I think that's what they're uh, 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 talking about. So we will talk about that. Uh, and overall, I think um, we've done a reasonable job. There's a lot of things about accessory things. You know, do you follow with shockwave therapy and other modalities? So I think that that's another uh, subject as well uh, for a panel. Recommendations for TMJ, I think the, the thing would be volume for TMJ, right? So it's such a small space, so be careful uh, there. And, um, you know, a lot of questions also on A2M. And I think that that's something that we really didn't talk about uh, here today. And, and I think it would probably just be primed, right, for the panel to discuss that with the protein concentrators uh, filters, right? Because then, you know, it's a big molecule, potential, lots of potential scientific benefits of it. I think we all see therapeutic benefits of it, by the way. And so then how do you get it? You know, and how much concentrate do you get? And those are all going to be the subjects of uh, the next, uh, I think, webinar, one of the next webinars. So, I so what I'm going to be talking about a little bit today is the more nitty gritty of the uh, business end of platelet-rich plasma and or the biologics and uh, how we talk to our patients about these uh, about these treatments and how we empower our patients uh, to embrace cash pay services. So uh, if we can just advance, that's me. And so the good news is is that cash pay services, actually empower our patients through increased autonomy, increased transparency, accessibility to care, more personalized precision care, and they get to be an active participant in their healthcare journey. So how do we do that? I have three easy strategies to really help empower our patients. One is to educate and inform, Two is to build trust and transparency. And then three is to really clearly address their concerns and provide support through this decision-making process. So 
the first one is educate and inform. And so really we have to talk about the advantages of cash pay. I talk to my patients all the time about this. You know, when they're thinking about going to get an MRI and they can't get the MRI approved, they can always get a cash pay MRI, get it scheduled the next week, and then we have the answer. So it's that, that accessibility uh, and ability to go forward when, uh, you know, maybe the, the jumping through the hoops is not working to the benefit of the patient. And then we have to talk about the specific benefits of our procedure, and we demonstrate that value of what that procedure is going to get them. And, and then I usually use uh, successes from my other patients with testimonials to say, hey, you know, you're not the only one in the boat. Uh, you know, this lots of people have had your same problem and have been helped with these procedures. So I start with pre-framing. And what I've done, and you guys can all steal this, is I've created a welcome video before my patients ever step foot in my practice. And I tell them, hey, I'm a different type of practice. I do a lot of cash pay or non-covered procedures. And I want you to understand a little bit more about why it is that we do this and how this practice works. I then use my video to educate on orthobiologics, what they are, how they work, what they're for. And then when they come to the practice, we identify our patient goals their reason for coming, their reason for taking time out of their day to come spend it with us. Next slide, please. So what we do um, when my MA or my nurse is checking them in or rooming them, they're asking and asking, asking, saying, you know, identifying their goals, identifying why they're here, identifying their pain, pain points before I ever step foot in the room for the consultation. And so we have to verbalize as physicians our understanding of our patients' why, and then ask, what would they consider a win? You know, if they're coming to see me for a shoulder pain where they can't lift uh, weights like they'd like, and I say, well, you know, if you could lift weights, um, would you consider that a win? And you could lift weights and it wouldn't bother you and it didn't hurt, would you consider that a win? And they go, oh, yes, of course. So then you want to build that trust and transparency. You know, you highlight your expertise. You use the ultrasound. You can give them a diagnosis right there and then. They've been jumping through hoops for months before they got to you. And then to give them a good diagnosis and a good working idea of how to fix that in one sitting uh, really helps. We then give them the clear uh, and concise cost. No uh, hemming and hawing. Listen, guys, just spit it out. It's, it's just the money. It's only money. Just tell them what the price is. Uh, and then I always encourage questions. I always say, hey, you know, what have you Googled? What have you been looking at? Tell me, let's hear, let's hear it all. I want to know. Uh, and then multiple ways to access the, the information that I'm going to be giving them. I'm going to give them a rip, written form. I'm going to follow up. I'm going to have it on my website. Uh, all of those touch points and ways for them to continue to be informed is super helpful. Next slide. Yeah, and oh, about the money, just spit it out. When we go to the store, we don't ask, oh, oh uh, you know, gosh, that, that bread price is expensive or, you know, it's $4, bread's $4. Some people think it's expensive. Some people think it's cheap. It just depends on what you need. If you're starving to death, it doesn't really matter if it's $4 or $40, you're gonna buy it. If you don't need bread and you're on keto, then $4 is really pricey for bread that you don't even need. Uh, so the price is the price, regardless of who you are. Uh, so that don't get hung up and don't assign your values to the price of what you have to offer. And please, please, please don't undervalue yourself. You are an expert. You know how to do this. You're helping patients. Please don't undervalue yourself. We don't want to be the low cost leader. Uh, so when we talk about cost, you know, I always am happy to um, blame the insurance companies that, that they don't value this. And they said, unfortunately, your insurance company doesn't cover it. They don't see the value in this, this um, treatment. But rest assured, we have hundreds of randomized controlled trials in the scientific literature that 
support use for this uh, procedure. Uh, just because the insurance company doesn't uh, support it doesn't mean that it's not a good treatment and uh, that will be beneficial for you. And then we talk about payment options. You know, in my practice, I take uh, care credit, uh, which helps kind of spread those payments over a number of months. And that seems to help some of our patients who uh, weren't sure that maybe they could uh, do that, but they do have care credit for their dog or, you know, for their dentist, um, and they can just use that. And then I always tie this back to the goals and I help guide their decision based on what their goals is. And do I think that I can achieve the goals with injection-based therapies of either orthobiologics, uh, PRP, or platelet pore plasma, or uh, you know, some, some type of cellular therapy. Uh, and you want to focus on the goal. You're, we're not selling the bridge; we're selling what's on the other side. You know, uh, if I'm going to San Francisco, I'm not like, well, you know, how many spindles are there? Is it is it 208 feet? Uh, you know, our patients actually don't care what the PRP is, they want to know that it's going to work. And so if we pre-frame, we have a goal-oriented, the patient's goals, oriented consult, give them the correct diagnosis, give them all of the treatment options from, you know, conservative to injection-based therapies to surgery, and then give them the price and then shut up. You do not have to tell them why that's the right price or why that's a good price, or you don't have to justify the price of your treatment and then schedule them. And so I'm sure you guys are all saying, but you don't understand my price, my patients are different. Uh, you know, my patients won't pay and we've heard them all. And I assure you, uh, we've heard everything. So, but doctor, I have insurance. Why should I pay out of pocket? Well, there's lots of things, there's lots of insurances that pay or don't pay. And, you know, what we're experiencing every day is actually more insurance companies that are choosing not to cover even preventative care. And unfortunately, the patients are stuck in the middle. And I just tell them, you know, unfortunately, our insurance companies are not there for your benefit and they're not there for my benefit. And so my job is to give you all the, the right diagnosis and all the options and uh, see what we can do. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to tell you what, whether it's covered or not, I'm going to tell you what I think is the right choice to solve your problem. Yeah. Well, how do I know it'll work? Well, because we have data. So I collect data on every single one of my patients and we have data for each problem and uh, these are all patient outcome uh, reported data. And, and what we're seeing with the, the BARB study is we have data that shows this is a beneficial treatment. Yes, I'm afraid of the procedure. Uh, so if they're afraid of the procedure, um, you know, they, they've heard from their friend that it was painful or they saw it on the internet and somebody was crying. I, what I do is I walk them through and I, I tell them, you know, we're going to draw blood. Oh, but I heard it's a lot of blood. Well, it's just four tablespoons. And uh, then you, we, we process it here on site. You don't have to go anywhere. You can hang out in our lounge. And then, you know, we go ahead and we do some numbing medicine and we use small needles. And really this is uh, done under ultrasound guidance, very precise and the maximum pain is uh, quite minimal during the procedure. Sometimes for the first 24 to 48 hours after the procedure, uh, it is sore enough to require some sort of uh, medication. But when compared to surgery, it's a whole heck of a lot uh, less painful uh, than surgery. Next question, but what? I can't afford it. And that may be true. And, and so, you know, some people say they can't afford it. Some people just uh, say that because we haven't shown them the value yet. We haven't shown them that these treatments have the ability to meet the, and exceed their goals. And so it really is important to get down to the nitty gritty of why they're there. Is it because they can't play there with their grandkids? Is it because it makes them feel old because they can't work out? Is it because they stopped working out and now they're 30 pounds heavier? And really, you got to do a little, little digging um, and, and be that empathetic listening ear to see, you know, how, how we can help them. These are good. Uh, I will consider it later. 
Um, and, and so, yeah, they can absolutely, this is not an emergency, but I do share with them what happens if they don't get the treatment. And we all know these partial thickness rotator cuff tears can progress and do progress um, at, at a known rate. Uh, meniscus tears or arthritis progresses. Uh, this is a progressive disease. And so the earlier we're able to catch this, uh, we do know that for arthritis, mild to moderate arthritis does respond better to uh, orthobiologics versus severe end-stage arthritis. So that age-old adage, uh, you just tolerate it until you can't anymore. Well, maybe we should do something sooner. Um, and, and this is something that's not, not very minimally invasive, not surgery, and we think we can actually actually uh, change the natural history of your disease. So please don't sell the bridge. They don't care how many spindles or how tall it is or how many platelets it has or how concentrated it is. They just want to know that this product and this treatment can get them where they want to go. They want the destination, not the bridge. So please, please, please empower your patients. Give them the autonomy Provide transparency and accessibility for personalized care with orthobiologics and cash pay treatments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the one is when using the filter, and do you have a filter there that you can show? Because we haven't, we haven't, we haven't introduced it yet. Uh, we talked about it, but we haven't shown any pictures yeah, of it just to, to show. Uh, so that's what it looks like, right? So you put in your plasma at one part and you're going to get your water coming out of the other and the concentrate. So uh, at the next webinar, we'll show you all about actually how to use that uh, along with the data that we promised. Uh, but then the question is, uh, uh, using the filter from Apex, do you need to draw 100 mLs of blood or can you just draw 60? Yeah, absolutely. You can just draw 60. Uh, th that's the lucky thing is it's pretty wetted. So you don't lose as much uh, fluid when you're uh, pushing the, the platelet part plasma through. I'm sure we've all had that experience where you think you got enough and then you, you end up and you're like, huh, I only have two cc's. I thought, I, is it stuck in the filter somewhere? So I just wanted to hand it back. Uh, to Josh for some final words on behalf of Apex. But again, as uh, the panel wants to thank everyone tonight uh, for uh, coming on, and we look forward to this continuing conversation going forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Gurgu. I, I appreciate it. We do want to extend thanks to everyone who attended, but uh, especially to our panelists with Dr. Mandelbaum, Dr. Gurgu, and Dr. Demers. The, your, your insight was absolutely uh, incredible to 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 watch and be part of your conversation and um to see that uh, live patient demo and then if you saw uh andrea held up at the end that a uh, significant amount of water that was pulled out of the platelet port plasma that's going to be discussed heavily in the future and so we are very excited for this series to continue we are again very grateful for the three of you and for your time we appreciate everyone joining us tonight and we uh, say, see you until next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>